Professor Richard Wolff is with us, the economist, co-founder of Democracy at Work, the author most re recently of Capitalism's Crisis Deepens, Essays on the Global Economic Meltdown. His website's democracyatwork.info and rdwolf with two Fs dot com. And you can tweet him at Prof Wolf. Uh, Dr. Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Tom. It's been a while, so I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to have you back, and, and, and thank you for, for being on the program. So the yield curve inverted yesterday or the day before. Uh, this has uh, a lot of the writers over at the Financial Times flipped out. This, you know, basically the, the, the long-term bonds are now paying less than short-term bonds are, uh, the 10-year versus two-year or three-year kind of thing. And typically this is, you know, presages a recession. The Dow is down 483 points as we speak. Um, what does all this mean? And, 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 and what does it mean to the average citizen? Well, uh, let's start with the uh, inverted yield curve. Normally, a um, lender will um, demand a higher rate of return the longer you want the loan to last, because that the longer the loan lasts, the more things can happen that might make it impossible for you to pay back and to protect himself. The lender says, okay, you pay me more for a 10-year loan than you would for a two-year loan. Uh, but if you believe that two years from now the economy is really going to be in bad shape, then you're not happy to lend to a person for a two-year loan uh, because you're really worried that that borrower won't be able to re repay. And so you demand more for the short-term loan because of your feeling of bad times coming than you do for long. And so when we see that happen, it's a sign that lenders, whose job it is to look at this situation, are seeing real trouble in the short run coming. And so that's why it's a recession signal and why people pay attention to it. It's been a pretty good signal in the past. So it's one more piece of evidence that our economic system here, which has a downturn on average every four to seven years, is due for one. And so we're pretty clear now, the majority of observers, that either in 2019 or latest 2020, we're going to have a, a downturn. And the only real question now is, how bad will it be and how long will it last? If it's anything like the one in 2008, we are in very deep trouble. But even if it isn't, uh, it's going to be trouble for Mr. Trump, trouble for the Republicans, because they're the ones in power when it hits. So they will get, likely, a good portion of the blame. Now, does this have any relation to the U.S. trade deficit? It's, it's now at a 10-year high, and Trump's whole shtick uh, two years ago when he was running for president was, I'm the guy who's going to get down the trade deficit. We're going to get it down with tariffs and, and, all, and, and jawboning and all this other stuff. It, it obviously has not worked out that way. Um, what does what does the trade deficit mean, and how does how does it um, interact with, or how is it related to the possibility of, re of cycles of uh, boom and bust here in the U.S. economy? Well, it, it's always the case that the ups and downs of the trade deficit are the result of many factors. All the factors that affect how many foreign goods Americans buy and all the factors that affect how many uh, foreign people and companies will buy American goods. And so you'd have to make a long list. That's why when politicians tell you they're going to do this or that and it's going to fix the problem, you should take that with an enormous grain of salt. They don't have that kind of power. They can't control that many variables. And so when Mr. Uh, Trump said he had the magic bullet with tariffs or Lord knows what uh, to fix this problem, everybody should have uh, grinned into their beer uh, rather than take it seriously. And what the recent numbers show is that, as has happened so many times, Mr. Trump's bravado, his boasts, his telling you how he's different and what he's going to do is going to make all the difference, was the kind of empty rhetoric uh, that's now revealed because the trade deficit not only did not go away, it's actually worse than it was when he made those statements starting a year and a half or so ago uh, and repeated them so often. So it's really one more lesson uh, in the fact that uh, politicians like to boast what they're going to do, like to take credit for what goes well, and then point the finger at somebody else uh, when it doesn't work out that well. As to the recession, yes, it's a very serious problem, mainly because foreigners are not buying American goods. 
They're not doing it in the growth that we had hoped for. That's partly because the economies in the rest of the world are in the same kind of slowdown that is now coming to the United States, so they're not buying. It's partly because they're imposing tariffs in retaliation to Mr. Trump so that their people have to pay a tariff, just like Americans have to pay a tariff after he sets it on foreign goods coming here, so the foreigners are not buying American goods. It's the, it's the, literally the reaction to Mr. Trump's imposition of tariffs as he boasts and panders to his base. So we're just seeing that Mr. Trump not only doesn't prevent the economic downturn that our system keeps visiting upon us, but in a peculiar way, he's actually making it worse. So uh, to my question of what, what impact does this have on the average working person? Well, I think that the, the, the bottom line is a, an economic downturn is always a catastrophe in capitalism. It actually threatens everybody, the big corporation, the medium corporation, uh, and the average worker. But the problem is we don't all have the same capacity to cope with an economic downturn. Corporations can solve their problems by laying off large numbers of workers, by cutting back production for a while, by parking their money overseas or in government bonds until the bad times pass. In a word, the higher you are in the pyramid, the easier it is to offload the problems of an economic downturn onto those below you. And so what happens is it accumulates, worst of all, for the mass of employees whose job conditions or whose very jobs are going to be threatened in this downturn. And again, the basic question, how bad will it be, how many people will be affected, and how long will it last? But the mass of the American working people are the ones who are going to bear the burden of most of the adjusting that this downturn is going to impose on us. How does this fit into a, uh, a Marxist critique of capitalism? Uh, you know, what, it, I'm assuming it just kind of follows along. And, 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 and what is the solution to this? Well, I think that the basic critique has always been, uh, and not just by Marxists, but by anyone with a, with, a, with a critical mentality, is that this is a system that is fundamentally unstable. For me to be able to say that in every capitalism, starting with England in the 18th century and spreading all over the world, every four to seven years there's been an economic downturn, and the only difference is how long they last and how deep they cut, with the worst ones being the 30s and, and the ones since 2008, the answer is capitalism visits upon us a level of instability. Well, here's how I do it in my classes. I lean across the podium and I say to my students, if you live with a roommate as unstable as capitalism, you would have moved out long ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we live in a system that, that we ought to have questioned, not only because it makes for such unequal distribution of the fruits of all of our work, but it has an instability built into it that we have tried for, for 300 years to cope with. We've tried every kind of fiscal policy, monetary policy, sure. Keynesian economics. We haven't been able to overcome it. That's why we're in one now. now, now we're facing what, another one. What preceded capitalism was feudalism, no? And right. I, 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 which is a very stable system. Uh, you that's know, you're right. born on the bottom, you live on the bottom, you die on the bottom, and that's the 95% of the people, right? That's right. It's a very stable, you know, I'm not saying that it had all wonderful things, but it did not have the instability of our system. So are we so moving back toward feudalism now? Well, one of the reactions to the instability of capitalism is precisely that. One of the things we're seeing uh, in the right-wing movements around the world is a desire to have some sort of authoritarian government, strong man at the top. We even have that in our country around Trump, somebody who's going to do something about the instability that has hurt so many people uh, by imposing some kind of stability. And, of course, they can't really do that without questioning the system. They're not prepared to do that. So everybody's waiting for the stability without facing the fact that with the economic system we have, that's not available, and no strong man is going to bring it either. Well, if, if we do away with all worker protections, and if we do away with the, the entire social safety net, which is what the Republicans want to do, um, yeah, how, how is the average worker different from a serf 
in the in the 1600s. He's not, and that's exactly the direction in which we are going. And that's part of what I meant before. When we offload the problems at the top, the protections that are being taken away, they pre- at least offset some of that offloading. But as we take those away, as we make Social Security less supportive, as we do away with the regulations, we're making it easier, even if that's not the intent, for corporations to push off the burden of economic downturns from capitalism onto the mass of people, substituting the old for the old secure jobs with benefits, the new kind of job, which is insecure, has few benefits, uh, where you work at the pleasure of an employer who fluctuates with the cycles of the system, that's right. You're going to get the millennial uh, people who we now bemoan having not enough money to sustain this economy. It's a self-reinforcing cycle of downturn because the system is in trouble but can't question itself. We keep we're looking for a magic bullet, but it's really because we don't want to yet face the system we have and the big question, can't we do better? Yeah, amen. And I know you offer a number of solutions in, in, your, uh, in your writings. Your most recent book, Capitalism's Crisis, deepens essays on the global economic meltdown. Professor Richard Wolff, Dr. Wolff, thank you so much for dropping by today. Thank you, Tom, and I look forward to talking with you again. Me too. Uh, democracyworkinfo rdwolf.com. We'll be right back.